begin by today by presuming that you are going to see a physician because you have a particular problem. And what happens when you get there is the first thing they do is they take a history. And probably the most important thing about making a diagnosis is in the history. So the history is extremely important, followed by a physical examination in which you get a tentative diagnosis. And then you go to laboratory tests or imaging procedures which verify what your tentative diagnosis is. And taking all of those things together as facts, and then it's taking into whatever associated medical conditions you may have. Most people, while they think they have one problem, have several problems. Now, probably everybody in this room has several medical problems that they're dealing with all the time. If you take these associated conditions and then you try to uh, ex examine the person's personality, what are they like? their age, their gender, their body build, their ethnic background, all of these things together tells you something about the person. And I think when you talk about medication and treatment, you're talking about treating a person, not a disease. The problem with medicine today is we're treating diseases and we're not treating people. Now, once you have these facts together, then you say to yourself, uh, what am I going to do about treating this problem? And for that, we have an algorithm. An algorithm is a step-by-step -step procedure for solving a problem. Now, I want to go into algorithms because I think it's extremely important. You take a young person who has graduated from college wants to go to medical school. Well, that's fine. There are all kinds of medical schools. There are five in Southern California, we have UCLA, USC, Loma Linda, we have UCSD and Irvine. And even now Riverside, Gail, Gail Riverside is developing their own medical school. Well, all medical schools are not equal. Uh, how about those graduates from Guadalajara or Granada? When you see a physician, you really don't know what their background is. But once they have finished medical school, then the, the, in the old days, they had an internship. But that's been abolished. We don't do internships anymore. We now go directly into residencies. And uh, what's that all about? Well, a residency is a two or three or four or five, or a seven year program, depending on what you're trying to do, what you hope to accomplish. But let's take for a moment the options that a particular medical school graduate has going into a residency. What can he do? Well, he can take general or family medicine. And unfortunately, most of the young people nowadays do not want to do that. They want to go into the specialty. Let me just take off a few specialties for you. Uh, how about for neurology, endocrinology, which is a, uh, the endocrine path, pituitary, adrenal, diabetes, hepatitis, ovarian, testicular, those things. How about hematology, oncology? Hematology covers all the blood diseases, and oncology, all the malignant diseases. Cardiology, you can be a clinical cardiologist and deal with patients who you can be a catheter pusher and do the procedures. Who makes the most money? The procedural guy does. How about pulmonology, gastroenterology? You can do uh, uh, colonoscopies till they're coming out your ears. But it's a very lucrative practice. You know why? <laughs> we even have doctors who do hematology. There's nothing but liver disease. Nothing but kidney disease. The people who do all the dialysis. Dermatology, physical medicine, a couple of new things. Pain management and palliative medicine. 
that's just in office practice. When we get into the hospital, we know that there are several people in there who do nothing but work in the hospital. It would be the hospitalist who works in the day, and the nocturnist who works at night, <laughs> and the intensivist who works in the intensive care units. Now, a, a fellow coming, or a fellow, I should say, a girl, medical school now has 52% women, uh, which is good. This is good in my estimation. But uh, you have all kinds of choices to make. And when you go into a residency, the first year may be general subjects, and the first and second year, maybe even the third year. But the fourth year, you're going into some subspecialty. And it's important that we have subspecialists because many of the things we deal with are simple in the, in the beginning. But as you get towards the end, they get much, much more complicated and difficult to manage. Unfortunately, with all of these specialists who are all doing very well financially, that leaves the general practice and family practice uh, open, and there are going to be all kinds of vacancies and, and people not available. With the Obamacare, we have 30 million new people being insured and who's going to take care of them? And everything that you read about in Medicare is your primary physician. And who is your primary physician? Usually a general practitioner, or a family medicine doctor, or a general internal medicine doctor. So it's kind of like a pyramid. You have general medicine on the bottom. You have internal medicine at the next layer. You then have cardiology, gastroenterology, pulmonology, all this until you get up to the, to the neurologist who works in the head. We didn't mention the psychiatrist. Well, how do these people get, get trained? Well, we talked about residency. When they get out of residency, they go into practice. And, and in my day, practice was private practice. Today, it's not private practice. Today, it's salary. Salary medicine. You're, you're, you're being salaried by a group or a clinic or a large corporate company like Kaiser or Scripps or one of the clinics, Mayo Clinic or even Clinic, where I come from at the University of Pittsburgh. They have a tremendous medical school. They also own every hospital within a hundred miles of this city. They control that. But when you control a large group of uh, things like hospitals, practices, and clinics, and people, the physicians that you hire to run these things, then you have to have some kind of organization. And th this is where the algorithm theory comes in. Algorithm, another word for that would be protocol. Suppose you have hypertension or diabetes. There's a protocol for what you should do, depending upon the degree of the, of the problem, let's say hypertension, and what you think is the cause of hypertension. And you can take one tree or another tree or another tree of the algorithm, but they're all spelled out so that organized medical groups do much the same thing. There may be some individual variation where you have some choice between one or two or three things, but in general, you're going to follow the algorithm. Why? Because if you want to get paid by Medicare, you have to produce <coughs> results. And the results are that you keep the people well, and you keep them well in your clinic or office, and not in the hospital. But hospitals have algorithms and protocols too. And if they don't follow those and their people come out of the hospital and go back in the hospital within 30 days, they will not be paid for that. So you can be sure that the hospital is going to be sure that the clinic that's associated with the hospital is following the algorithm for the specific disease. And you're getting a treatment that is approved 
and has been studied, proved, researched by all of the major associations we have. The American Heart Association, the Diabetes Association, all of the American College of Specialties. Every specialty I've listed to you has an American college, and they're all doing postgraduate work because every state in the union demands that their physicians have so many hours of postgraduate training every year or they lose their licensure. 